Now, we're in a series called Story Time, and we're unpacking the stories of Jesus. So today, I'm going to start with a little bit of a story as we start our teaching time. And it, it involves this gentleman right here. This guy's name is Junior Weir. Some of you would know Junior. I saw his wife is already in the chat room. Uh, junior it, uh, has grown up in this church. Uh, he's uh, mentored our junior highs. He's been involved in, over, in our youth ministries here. But he's a police officer for York Region. Uh, he's also a member of our deacon board. This is our board of deacons. Uh, these are volunteers from our church community that serve alongside our staff to provide leadership for this church. And juniors right on the end, this is Daniel Lung, Charmaine Francis, Joel Smith, Nalini Sen, Gladson Thomas, Rohan Apadurai. I'm in the back with no hair, Joe Shum, and Philip Chamberlain right at the end. Great group of volunteers. So Junior serves on that team, but a few years ago, Junior asked me to come to a fitness thing that he, a part of, Resilience Fitness, and it, it was, uh, for two reasons, I hesitated to come. Uh, one was, I already had my own fitness routine. I was running, I was working out, I, I had my own thing going. But really, the only reason I didn't want to go was, it was winter, and the class started at 6 a.m. That means getting in a cold car at least by 5.30 to be able to get to this place. So eventually I gave in. I gave in. How can you resist that 10,000 kilowatt smile as Junior would invite you to go be a part of this? So I show up. It starts with a one kilometer run and I'm a little competitive. I'll admit it. I'm a little competitive. So I'm there and I'm thinking, I'm going to test myself. And you know what? I finished second in that run. You know who finished behind me? Junior. And I was thinking like, man, I finished in front of Junior. Junior's a police officer. I'm a pastor. Oh, okay, I didn't, and you know, you start thinking like, I didn't know I was that good, right? And then we move into the next phase and it was some jumping jacks, some burpees and some, some sprints. And again, I was like in the top three. Guess who was behind me? Junior, Junior was behind me. And so I'm feeling pretty good as the class leader, Andrew, kind of calls everyone into a circle. I'm thinking it's about 18 minutes into this class. And, and uh, I, like I'm feeling it, like I've been going hard for 18 minutes there. And Andrew says these words, because I'm thinking, why is he calling them in? Maybe he's calling them in to point me out. Like, look at this guy. He's brand new, and he's killing it. Be more like him. But that wasn't what he said. He said this. He said, okay, the warm-up is done. Now let's get down with the class. Now, I was completely gassed at this point. I, I was given everything I had. And Junior comes around with that big smile, slaps me on the back, and he said, Pastor, you better pace yourself, it's a long class. And for the rest of the class, I came in like dead last in almost everything, and Junior was like first in everything. I learned a valuable lesson that day, a lesson all of us could stand to learn. And the lesson is simply this. Don't come to a battleground with a playground mentality. Uh, don't, don't come with a playground mentality to a battleground environment because either you're gonna get hurt or the people around you are gonna get hurt. We know what that's like though, don't we? We all do this. Uh, think about that first year of university. You know, your first opportunity to kinda get away and you're excited about university and listen, if you're a student and you were supposed to go in September and you're online this coming fall and you're a little disappointed, I feel badly for you, but we're gonna get through this and keep your chin up, keep your chin up right now. But if you go to university and it feels like a playground, doesn't it? It's fun, you meet new friends, you have opportunities, there's all kinds of clubs and moments, and so it can feel like a playground until exams happen. And all of a sudden you realize what felt like a playground was not a playground at all. This is a battleground moment. Uh, it's the same at work. We can go to work and we, we get to meet, we have friends and relationships and connections and we do our jobs and we get something out of it. And sometimes we find ourselves doing what we need to do, but nothing more because that's work. And uh, all of a sudden it comes annual review time or promotion time. And we see people that were on our same work team, our peers, who are treating work like a battleground, not a playground. And they worked extra hard and they saw the rewards of it. And we're a little disappointed because we misread it. I don't think there's any other arena that we do this more often in than in relationships, especially any sort of those romantic or you know, affectionate relationships because they all start with a playground feeling, don't they? A feeling of excitement, energy, 
spontaneity. There's a newness, a freshness, a, a fun element to it. And then all of a sudden, when it gets to the phase in a relationship, I call it the grown-up moments, those moments where you got to battle th some things through. you got to fight for this relationship. Many of us who are addicted to the playground experience bail on relationships when they get to the battleground moments. See, we often make the mistake. It doesn't mean that school or work or relationships shouldn't have playground moments. In fact, I would say this, they need to have playground moments. Every relationship needs to have those fun, kind of carefree moments where the, you, you just kind of fill your tank in those moments. I think healthy workplaces need to have playground moments, fun moments where people connect in community and they build friendships. I also think school should have those playground moments. But, but I, I, I think it's a big mistake when we think that those things should feel like a playground all the time. Jesus understood this. Jesus was so good at playground moments. Whether it was a wedding feast he was attending, whether it was a tax collector's party, or whether it was hanging out with his disciples, he was fully present in those moments, enjoyed those moments, had fun and levity in those moments. But he never lost sight of the fact that he was in a battlefield. He was in a battleground and the stakes were high. See friends, we need to be careful, and we need to always remember that you, you visit a playground, but you live in a battleground. Uh, you, we visit a playground. There's moments where you're visiting it, and it's really good. But friends, don't make the same mistake many of us do in life. And sometimes we don't see it until we're later in life. And we realize, man, work is a battleground. Life is a battleground. Family is a battleground. Relationships, they're a battleground. And there's a lot at stake in these moments. Along life's journey, we need to remember to treat it that way. Because in a battlefield, what are you doing? You're staying constantly aware. You want to have a hyper-awareness in a battlefield. You want a woke mentality to be alert and awake. There's a famous Baptist preacher from the 1800s in England. His name was Charles Spurgeon. And he said this to Christians. He said this, when you sleep, remember that you're resting on a battlefield. When you travel, suspect an ambush in every hedge. Now, what's he saying? Almost, is he saying be paranoid? No. He's saying be ready. Have a readiness about you. Because even when you're sleeping, you're resting on a battlefield. Uh, be aware because you never know when an ambush is going to happen. Jesus would say it to his disciples this way. Be gentle as a dove and wise as a serpent or cunning as a serpent. In other words, be gentle as a dove. Be a person of peace. Be involved, but be aware. Be cunning. Be wise in the way you navigate life. So today we're going to visit one of the stories of Jesus of a dad. It's Father's Day, so I'm speaking to you dads. And you know what? The rest of it, it's going to apply to us also but a dad who finds himself in a battleground moment. If you want to follow along, turn to page 70 of your Jesus Project book or turn to Luke chapter 8, verses 41 to 55. Here's the story. It starts this way. Then a man named Jairus, and he's the principal character besides Jesus in this text that we'll be focusing on. Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at, the, at Jesus' feet, pleading with him, to come home with him. There's so much happening here. This is very interesting. The word pleading also means begging. So here's the imagery. Jesus is coming into the village and this man of notoriety, of significance, falls at his feet and begs him to come to his house with him. It's the same Greek word pleading that is used in Luke chapter 15. And it's an interesting story. It's the prodigal son story in Luke chapter 15. And Pastor Keith is going to talk about that next week. And if you know the story, you know that this father had two sons. And one went and took his inheritance early and squandered it all. And he came home with his cap in hand. And the father welcomes him back in and he throws a big feast. And the older brother who had stayed loyal and faithful and stayed there, he, he refused to come into the feast. And so the... The father goes outside the feast area and the banquet and he falls at his son's feet and it says the same Greek word, he begged his son to come in. Now that would have been shocking to the listeners when Jesus was telling that story in Luke 15 because that was so improper in that first century culture. 
I think it even rings as being improper even in our you know, 21st century culture. It was improper in that the elder did not bow to the younger. What is a father doing banging his son? It, it was seen as being not appropriate. It was, it was wrong. It was even embarrassing. Like, where's your pride, dad, in that moment? And this is the same place Jairus finds himself. He's at the feet of Jesus. And you got to understand, he's a religious leader, a leader in the synagogue. And all, many of the religious leaders were, were anti-Jesus. They were threatened by Jesus. So for him to fall at his feet, he was the king of the gram in his area. He was the one that everyone looked to. Everyone knew who Jairus was. He was successful. He would have been a man of means and had some wealth. And here he is groveling at Jesus' feet, begging for him to come to his house. See, this man's so desperate. He's so desperate. He doesn't even care what this will cost him socially. He doesn't care what this will cost him and how many people will unfollow him because he's, he's coercing or he's, he's relating to a person that the religious establishment felt threatened by. Here he is at his feet. And many of the people would have been looking on and they'd be wondering, why is Jairus there? See, I think sometimes, do we not judge a lot? We judge people, don't we? You know, we get a little judgy, don't we? I think sometimes we look at people and they seem to have a silver spoon or their life seems so good or they've got money or they drive a nice vehicle or their family looks like they're all happy and we mistakenly think they have no struggles. You know, I was uh, watching this YouTube video and Pastor Keith mentioned this uh, famous Canadian astronaut, Chris Hadfield, a couple of weeks ago in his message and, and I, I had seen this little clip and it came back to my memory when I was reading this text of Jairus and in it, uh, the interviewer asked Chris Hadfield, if you could call your 20-year-old self, what would you say to your 20-year-old self? And here's what he said. Three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. If you could make a phone call to the 20-year-old Chris, um, what would you tell him? I think what might have been worthwhile to explain to myself at 20 is to recognize that every single person you meet is struggling. I didn't know that then. You tend to see other people as completely formed individuals. I still do sometimes. But to recognize that everybody you meet, every single one of them, no matter how expensive their suit is or, or how um, serious their expression is, they are uh, looking for significance. They are trying to uh, do the best they can and they fail regularly and, and they're, they're you know, within their own particular battle of, of their own life. And so cut them some slack for that. Don't, don't let them off the hook, but recognize the, uh, the shared nature of being a, a human being. And, and let people be themselves, make some allowances for them, treat people a little more kindly as a result. How different this world would feel if we knew that every person we met and every person we knew, everyone was struggling and everyone fails regularly. That even some of the people that look pristine in nature, somewhere in their life there's a struggle. It might be financial, it might be in their physical bodies. It might be in their mind. It might be their emotions. They might be struggling in a relationship they can't repair or fix. They might be struggling in a marriage where they can't find that love again. They might be struggling with a child that they can't fix. But everyone is struggling. How different it would be if we understood that in this life. Now, the fact is, and this is what I'd love you to say out loud if you would with me. If that's the truth, we need to recognize that Everyone is on a battlefield. Can you say that with me? Everyone is on a battlefield. Everybody we know, including you, everyone I'm talking to, you're on a battlefield and everyone is struggling in this battle. And that's why this world needs kindness. We need kindness. But kindness is a difficult thing to quantify because I've never met a person who felt like they weren't kind. 
I've never had anyone on all the years I've been pastoring, 28 some odd years, I've never had someone approach me and say, I'm not a kind person. Everyone thinks they're kind. Here's though, the biblical understanding of kindness looks like this. Kindness is the marrying of two things. Kindness is the marrying of a motivation, a motivation to be kind, and an action in order to bless someone else. Those two things need to come together for biblical kindness to be understood. Now, here's the thing. I know this. I get it in my life. You've done it in your life. Sometimes we get one side of that. Sometimes we feel motivated towards kindness. We feel kind things in our heart when we see somebody struggling or we want to help someone or a people group or something, and we feel it. But kind things in our heart or kind expressions in our heart that don't marry actions, the Bible would say, in fact, that's not very kind. It's an intention that never works its way, works its way into an action. The inverse is true too. Maybe you've experienced this. Have you ever experienced someone who did something kind, but you know there was lots of strings attached? Maybe sometimes in life, and we can do this with family members, even as they age and, and we have more things we're responsible for, and you do kind things and you could start to be resentful though. So the motivation isn't right, the action is right, but without the motivation and the action coming together, we can't posture our hearts to actually be a blessing. So what does it look to be kind? Jesus was so good at this. Moved with compassion, he took action. He expressed his kindness. So here he is, he's walking to this village. Jairus, this important man, is on his knees begging Jesus, come to my home. And Jesus does. You know what's interesting about Jairus in this moment? He's a rich man and he's more used to people being at his feet not having to sit at somebody else's feet. He's an important synagogue leader. Many people may have done the very same thing, fallen at his feet, begged for help. He's not used to having to beg someone else for help though. I, I know this is true, and this is why he was so desperate. He was desperate because he was a dad, and he was in a losing battle moment. His 12-year-old daughter is about to die. And he's at his feet. Now, i got to tell you this. I believe this is true. If Jairus wasn't so desperate, he wouldn't have been at Jesus' feet. There's a gift, at least in my life, in some of the losing I've experienced. Because the losing has caused me to reach out for the victor and reach out for his hand, Jesus. Here's what happens, though. So he's at Jesus' feet, and this is what the text says. His only daughter was about 12 years old, was dying. So his daughter's dying. This has caused this desperation, this moment where he is turning to Jesus to look for help. And it goes on to say this. As Jesus went with him, he was surrounded by the crowds. Now, this is, I would love you to say these three words out loud with me where you are. Went with him. Went with him. Because that's key. As Jesus went with him, him, he was surrounded by the crowds. The crowds want to see a miracle. They want to see something happening. But there's something powerful about Jesus going with them. You know, I, I won't, I, let me ask you this question. How brave are you? How courageous are you? I've had over the years of leadership, and I've had the privilege of serving in many different cities and communities and churches. And over the years, every once in a while, someone will say, hey, that was really brave of you, or that was courageous. You said this, or you did that. And I always think to myself, you don't really know me. I'm not that brave. I'm not that courageous. I'm really not. But there is something in me when I acknowledge and I feel and I know that the one who is with me is greater than anything that will oppose me. There is a courage. I can't can't explain it, but maybe you've felt it, that wells up inside of me to say things that I know are according to God's kingdom, to to lead towards things that are going to free people and and are going to be a part of healing people because I know greater is he that is with me than he that is in this world. In fact, those are the words of the Apostle John. Greater is he that is with you 
If you're in Jesus, he is with you, friends. He's with you in the middle of the battle. He's with, with you when you feel like you're losing. He's with you when you've won and you've not even acknowledged him. Greater is he that is with you than anything that will come against you. What a powerful truth. What a powerful word there. So when Jesus says, I'll go with you to Jairus, can you imagine the hope that resonated in his heart and just begin to grow in that moment? He came with one express purpose, get Jesus to my house. Let the healer do what the healer does. So he now, it's mission successful. Jesus is on the way with Jairus. He's headed this way. And you kind of know what's going to happen next because we talked about this a few weeks ago when I was teaching about the centurion's faith and the woman who touched the hem of Jesus' garment. You understand in the middle of Jairus' story is a delay, a painful delay. Jesus encounters a woman who's also ill. And Jesus stops to talk to her. Now, Jairus, I can only imagine as a dad, the agony as he felt waiting for Jesus to finish with this woman. And, it, and on the natural, it didn't even seem, it doesn't even feel rational because he stops to deal with a woman with a chronic condition and he seems to ignore the little girl with the acute condition. We all know there's a difference between a chronic and acute condition. A chronic condition has been going on for years. What's a few more hours? I could see Jairus going and wanting to step in and say, hey, Jesus, you can circle back and have your conversation with this woman. Let's get going. But he sits there and he's waiting on the teacher, the healer, the, this man that, that is the one who's done miraculous things. He's waiting for him to finish with this woman. See, here's what happens, though. There's a long enough delay that things change and circumstances change. It says in verse 49, and while he was still speaking to the woman who Jesus just had healed, a messenger arrived from the house of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. He told him this, your daughter is dead. Jairus, the battle's over. You've lost this battle. Now leave the teacher alone. Don't, don't bother Jesus anymore. The battle's over. It goes on to say in verse 50, but when Jesus heard what had happened, so he must have overheard this person say it to Jairus or someone else whispered in his ear, hey, Jesus, uh, Jairus' daughter's dead. It says this, that Jesus turned to Jairus and said, don't be afraid. Can you say that out loud with me? Don't be afraid. Just have faith. Can you, let's say that whole line together. Don't be afraid, just have faith, and she will be healed. This is an amazing moment. So Jairus falls in line with Jesus, and it says this in verse 51. When they arrived at the house, it was filled with people weeping and wailing. But Jesus said, stop the weeping. <laughs> she isn't dead. She's only asleep. And in the text, if you're reading it, it says they even laughed. Some of the people laughed at this. Then Jesus took her by the hand, this young 12-year-old lifeless body, took her by the hand and said in a loud voice, my child, get up. And at that moment, her life returned and she immediately stood up. There's a big lesson in this for all of us, friends. A big lesson. It's a lesson if you've been following Jesus, you, you've had to learn this over and over and over. It's a lesson that if you're not presently a follower of Jesus, I'm going to pray with you at the end of the gathering, give you that opportunity, but I want to kind of pre-warn you. Here's a lesson that Jairus learns that you and I would be good to learn. It's simply this. You will always, can you say the word always? You will always give and get far more than you bargain for when you go to Jesus. You will always give Give and get far more than you bargain for every time you come to Jesus. Look at Jairus. He, he didn't come. He came for a cure. That's what he was looking for, not a resurrection, right? He came to Jesus to, to get a cure. He had heard of Jesus' healing power, and he's thinking, if I could just get Jesus to my house, I know it'll be okay. He wasn't looking for a resurrection, but Jesus required more of him. This child passes away, 
And that long moment where Jesus looks at him after his daughter has died and basically he says to him, trust me, trust me. Jairus thought he was going to have to trust him for a cure, not a resurrection. That's a whole different level of trust. Here's the amazing thing when you come to Jesus. Jesus is looking more, he's looking for more than a moment from you. He's looking for a life with you. He's looking for more than a part of you. He's looking for all of you. And you'll find that the more you give of yourself, actually, (laughs) it's beautiful. The more you experience all of Him for you, you will get far more than you ever bargained for. You might come to Jesus to take care of this part of your life and you realize, whoa, he swings open the door to so much more than you could have ever imagined when you're coming to him. Now, it's interesting. He comes to this house, this place of death. He walks in. Everyone's grieving and weeping and crying. And he comes to the bedside of this 12-year-old lifeless body. And he takes her by the hand and he says these two words. And the original language he spoke them in, they're really meaningful. He says this word first. He says, Talitha, which means little girl, which might sound fairly obvious, right? A more of a descriptive term. But it's actually lost on us because in the first century, Talitha would have been a little bit like a pet name. I don't know if you have pet names. If you're a dad or a mom, do you have pet names for your kids? And uh, I know my, my wife... Uh, her mom used to call her Bunny Rabbit. Now, she was, she was an only child, and so I guess, you know, it's easy to come up with pet names. Now, she asked me if I had a pet name, and I just I got thinking about it. Like, I'm one of six kids, right? So I think my parents were lucky to get my name right. You know, I don't know how many times in the moment of being disciplined or something, rightfully deserved, my mom would say, Peter, Malcolm, Philip, maybe even one of my sister's names, Lynn, Suzanne, Jonathan, finally get to my name. So there's no pet names in my house. But a pet name was endearing. In the first century, probably the best way to understand that word Talitha is basically Jesus came alongside this this body, this shell of a girl, 12-year-old, and he uses the term, it'd be almost in our modern vernacular, it'd be like saying, honey. And then he says this word, Talitha Kamu, which means wake up, wake up. I mean, this is beautiful imagery, friends. And this is powerful for you and I to check out and recognize what's happening in this moment. It's like a parent coming in to wake their child up to go to to school. Honey, it's time to wake up. It's It's so intimate in this moment. It's so beautiful and it's so different than some of the other healing accounts we hear in Scripture. You know, Jesus doesn't come in that day and appeal to a higher power. He is the higher power. totally different. Jesus doesn't come in and it's not a dramatic moment like Elijah in the Old Testament laying across, prostrate a dead corpse and bringing it back to life. No, Jesus just comes alongside, grabs her by the hand and says, honey, it's time to wake up. I want you to recognize the power of this man. It's significant. This man has faced forces like that big storm on the Sea of Galilee that Pastor Keith talked about that was quieted. He's facing a force today in that moment that's much more powerful than that storm. He's facing a force in this moment that is much more powerful than the demons that he set a man free from, that commanded him. He's facing the inescapable greatest fear in the human race, death itself. And for Jesus... Jesus reaches down, says, honey, it's time to wake up. And he pulls her up from death into life in that moment. You see, friends, if Jesus has got you by the hand, even death, it's just a good night's sleep. There is nothing impossible for Jesus. Is Jesus with you? You know, I think of Jairus in this moment, and I think of you dads. And I know you carry a lot of weight because, you know, sometimes dads, 
you're the person people look to for answers. Sometimes you're the person people look to for strength. When something bumps in the night, you get up. Who do you go to? Who do you go to for your strength? Who do you go to with your battle? Who do you go to when you're losing? I know too many men that live in isolation. They could be very social people, but nobody really knows them because they're afraid. I get it. I get it. It's a lot of pride to getting down on your knees in front of Jesus. There's all, even for those of us who are followers of Jesus already, it's keep coming back to that place. So here's, here's my questions for you guys as, as I end. Every one of you. Are you weary? Are you tired? Are you in a battle right now? Are you losing? The invitation is to come to Jesus. The invitation is to run to the Father.